behalf of a coalition that is supporting small dollar loan reform in Kansas. I would like to request introduction of a small dollar loan reform bill, 21RS0522. Committee, any questions or objection? Yes. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I believe the committee rules uh, require that the name of this group on behalf of whom the legislation is being offered be disclosed and included in the committee's minutes. And I ask that be done. Thank you. It's yes, Cantons for Payday Loan Reform. Any other questions? Good question, Representative Carmichael. I was making notes and you caught that for me. Seeing no questions or objections, we will get that one introduced. Thank you. Is there anyone else here today? Let me look down below. I don't see anyone, but anyone else here with a request, bill request? Okay, we'll move on committee. Uh, we have three bill hearings today. The first one, I will open the hearing on House Bill 2079 and ask Natalie to let us know what this one's all about. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, House Bill 2079 would transfer duties um, related to the Address Confidentiality Program. It's otherwise known as the Safe at Home Program from the Secretary of State to the Attorney General. So sections one through eight um, relate to that transfer. Um, you'll see several references to the Secretary of State's office crossed out and replaced with the Attorney General. Um, You'll see there in section one, KSA 75451, um, this program seeks to provide address confidentiality for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, or stalking. And um, program participants are able to obtain a designated address to be used as a substitute mailing address um, in those um, circumstances. So the primary amendment made in, in all the sections is to um, strike out the Secretary of State's office and replace it with the Attorney General's office. Um, there is one thing I would note um, in Section 6, KSA 75456. Um, there it does maintain the current law, which is um, requiring the Secretary of State to adopt rules and regs prescribing voting procedures to maintain confidentiality of the address um, uh, for those people who are uh, participants in this program. And I can take any questions. Thank you, Natalie. Our first question is Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with the chair's permission, I actually have two inquiries. Uh, first, do we know whether or not the Secretary of State has adopted uh, regulations pursuant to KSA 75-456? And if so, what's the site? I believe they have, but I will have to uh, check that again and get the citation for I you. I think we may have Mr. Parker here, and I'm sure he'll know the answer to that if he, if he testifies. Um, my other inquiry is this bill seems very, very familiar. I think we saw it last year and between research and or the revisor. Do we know what the prior bill number was and what fate it met last year? So last year, that bill um, was a Senate bill, Senate Bill 293, and that bill actually contained a few different things. It contained um, the provisions that we're hearing right now, the provisions that we're going to hear a little bit later related to charitable organizations, that transfer, and it also contains some pro provisions about um, the prosecutorial authority of the Secretary of State related to voting crimes. And in terms of what happened to that bill, it looks like it passed out of the Senate. Obviously, it came to our committee. Um, we had a hearing on it, it looks like, on March 16th. Um, but, you know, we I think we went home a couple of days after that. And so it did die in our committee. And just quickly, do you happen to have there uh, what the vote was in the Senate? Is that convenient? If not, I can look it up. Um, Yes, it was 38-1. It bodes well for its success in our committee as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? I do not see any. So we'll move on to proponents. Today, we start off with Michelle McCormick in her new role. She's been before us before, but I think this is her first time since she's been at the AG's office. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Chairman Patton and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Michelle McCormick. I'm the Director of Victim Services here at the Attorney General's Office. 
Um, and as you can see, uh, this bill is pretty straightforward in transferring the Safe at Home uh, program to our Victim Services Division. Uh, our office worked in conjunction with the Secretary of State's office on this. And essentially, we think it's a really good fit for our division. Uh, our existing staff uh, provide services to crime victims across the state every day. Um, and besides uh, being specialized in our training, we also have um, you know, additional contact with the enrolling agents that are identified in the statute. So those advocates who work at domestic and sexual violence uh, programs already receive training and technical assistance from our division, uh, and we provide some grant funding for them. Uh, so we have a lot of existing relationships that we think uh, set this uh, program up for success in our division. Uh, and so in, essentially I'm here on behalf of the Attorney General's office saying that we uh, support this bill uh, in the transfer of this program to our agency. Uh, and, and with that, I'll stand for questions. Any questions? I am not seeing any in real life or in in like in a fake life over there on the side. So we will move on to Clay Barker. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for allowing us to testify. The Secretary of State's office is also a proponent of this legislation. In 2019, Secretary Schwab had us do a complete review of all the bucket of tasks that the Secretary of State's office has in the legislature. And we identified some that we thought would be a better fit at other agencies. And after discussing it with the Attorney General, this was one that we thought should be moved. Uh, just to give you a quick overview of it, the, the program allows victims of sexual abuse or stalkers to have their mail forwarded to a PO box and then we forward it to their address. So their address is secret. It also allows them to register to vote through us. So the county will know that there is a safe at home participant in precinct 1-1, but they, they vote by mail unless they choose to give up their identity and their location and, and vote in person on election day. Um, we feel for the reasons given before that it is a better fit with the Attorney General's office. Right now, there's about 137 families in the program with about 340 children, minors total. Uh, there's no fees to participate in it, so it brings in no revenue, and it costs our office about $4,400 a year in stamps and administrative supplies. Uh, we have one young uh, clerk handle the program. She has no special training in, in victim issues, but she's very confident and knows where to draw the line when she starts getting questions that go beyond her expertise and we refer them to victim services in the attorney general's office, which is just upstairs from us. And so we think this is just a better fit and the, the customers for this process will be better served by the attorney general having control of the program. Other, it'll be a very seamless move from one office to the other. And uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I stand for any questions. Uh, any questions? Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Barker. Always good to hear from you again. Um, are there regs that implement 75456? Uh, yes, Representative. I'm just going to add that in. It's uh, Regulation 7 44 1 through, and there's several of them that just give some details about what can be released to law enforcement, voting registration procedures, things like that. Uh, in fact, I recall processing a voter through at the polls one time, and we actually had to go look that up, what we were supposed to do, but we got it done. Um, my, I guess my more important question is, does, in the bill, did we, what we do about that regulatory authority, is it being transferred to the AG, or is the reg going under the AG's regs? Does it have to be reenacted? What do we need to do about that? I'd have to go look at the bill again. I believe it's being transferred to the Attorney General's office. I'm not sure about regulations about voting that may be retained with us. Mr. You... Chairman, uh, um, so uh, the rules and regulations provisions are staying with the Secretary of State's office. Let me try to find that exact. I believe it's in section six. Let me get a line number. Consistent with my memory as well. Yeah. 
yeah, so if you look on um, page five, starting at line um, 23, the Secretary of State's office will still be doing the rules and regs for that portion. So, Mr. Barker, is that something that we need to fix? Do you want to keep promulgating and being responsible for the AG's regulations, or do we need to carve out the voting portion of this and keep it with your office? How do we handle this? I might just clarify. So the voting regulations are staying with the Secretary of State's office. All the other regulations related to the program will now be under the purview of the Attorney General's office. Okay, now that, that makes more sense. Does the Attorney General then need to re-promulgate and reenact the regulations so that they are his and not the SOS's? And are we going to have to move it in the, in the uh, rules and regs? So it falls under the AG's number, or does it stay where it's at? How, how's that going to work? Um, so, and I'll actually let, I mean, as you know, the Attorney General's office is very involved in the rules and regs processes as well. And so I assume that they will recodify those under their own um, article heading, but but I'll, I'll let um, Attorney General Schmidt speak to that. And then presumably there'd have to be a revocation of the SOS's regs that don't apply. And this is not purely academic. We had a situation several years ago involving the State Law Enforcement Commission, where we had regulations that had been superseded and outdated from other prior agencies, and, and we couldn't enforce them, and it was it was an unpleasant time. So I just share that with the committee. Okay, Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question, Clay, I just want to make sure I understand. Um, did you say that it's a P.O. box that they have as their mail and then it comes to you and then you forward it? That's correct. The Secretary of State's office rents a one P.O. box. So it's the same P.O. box number for every participant. And it would just say John or Jane Smith with that P.O. box. We get it. We know that person's real address or at least where they want their mail sent, and we forward it usually once a week in a large envelope. They'll get all their mail. And how does uh, someone join that program? Uh, they get referred to it through victim services. There's a, a technical name for the term or the person that can refer to us. Uh, we review it and then meet the criteria. They're enrolled in the program and, and they're informed of the, uh, the costs and benefits you know, anonymity can lead to some problems that you just don't get regular mail. You have to get it through us. Okay, I, I know that doesn't have a lot to do with this bill, but I was just interested. But when and the victim services is in the um, is in the attorney general's uh, department, and and that was Michelle, or you have one too? That's, that's uh, no, the the. Attorney General has the victim services. We have no expertise in dealing with that. We just do the administrative forwarding of mail. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Seeing none. Is there anyone else here today as a proponent? Okay. I do not see anyone listed as a neutral or an opponent. Do we have anyone online? Not seeing any of those either, so we'll close the hearing on House Bill 2079, open the hearing on House Bill 2080, and throw it back to the uh, Mr. Chair, again, thank you for allowing us to testify in support of this bill. This was another area we identified that the Attorney General agreed with us uh, to transfer from our office to, to theirs. And what it is, is it's three closely related registrations with our office. One is certain charitable organizations, and it does not include the, the usual well-known ones that file with the federal government, 501c3s, education, churches, things like that. The second are professional fundraisers for charitable organizations, and the third are fundraising solicitors. And essentially the difference is a fundraiser is a manager and a solicitor is the person that makes the calls. And they just fill out an information sheet with us so they're on file so people see who they are, that they're legit. 
and we believe this fits better with the Attorney General's office, and the Attorney General can give you a little more background on it, why, but because they tend to have more supervision while we're just a registration office. And initially, we were made the receipt of these registrations because that's what the Secretary of State does when you file stuff. And at the time, the Attorney General's office did not have much registration capability, but they do now. So it just makes it a seamless fit. If they do both the registration, the enforcement, investigations all together in one entity. And there will be some financial impact. There are fees that are filed with our office, but it's not much money when people register and those fees are used to help defer the cost of the program. Very good. Before I do questions for Clay, I'm going to go back to Natalie and have Natalie fill no. in blanks there. No, you're you're fine. This this hybrid thing sometimes I don't speak clearly, and other times people don't hear me. So we're getting through it just fine. <laughs> you're perfect. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And actually, um, he did a great job explaining what the bill does, really. So um, House Bill 80 would transfer duties related to the registration for charitable organizations from the Secretary of State to the Attorney General's office. New Section 1 would create a new charitable organization's fee fund that would now be administered by the Attorney General. Um, it provides that money in that fund would be used to carry out the provisions of the Charitable Organizations and Solicitations Act. New Section 2 then transfer the, le the legal custody of the records and other items um, from the Secretary of State's office to the Attorney General's office. Um, Section 3 amends KSA 17, 1759 to include that new Section 2 under the Charitable Organizations Act. And then Section 4 maintains current law regarding um, charitable organizations that are not required to register, but it changes the references from the Secretary of State to the Attorney General throughout, um, similar to the other bill. Um, that same change is made um, in sections 5 through 12. And then also in section 5, uh, KSA 17, 1763 is amended. Um, and there's an increase um, in the registration fee for each charitable organization from $20 to $25. And then in section 6, uh, 17, 1764, the bill imposes a new fee of $25 on every professional fundraiser. Um, that's already required to register under the act. And then in section seven, which is 17, 17, 65, the bill imposes a new fee of $25 on every professional solicitor. Um, again, those folks are already required to register. And I can take any questions. Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Initially, I'd raised my hand to request a review from the reviser. But now my question for the reviser is, this also sounds very familiar, was the same idea introduced previously and what fate did it meet last year? So, uh, Mr. Chairman, that bill that I referenced earlier, Senate Bill 293, that bill was a bundle of the, it, as originally introduced, it would have had the safe at home provisions, these provisions, and then the prosecuting authority provisions. Um, as it came over to you, it just had these two provisions. So the charitable organizations, um, provisions in the safe at home. So same, same vote and everything. Thank you. And for everyone's sake, wondering about that third piece, the prosecuting authority of the Secretary of State, we have another bill introduced by our ranking member that we will be hearing. Uh, yeah, I know no one else would introduce it. So <laughs> introduced by the ranking member. So we will be hearing that in the near future. Any other questions for Natalie, Representative Humphreys? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Natalie, in the section um, five, uh, or sorry, section six, the bill imposes a new fee of $25. So there was not a fee at all. It wasn't going up from 20 to 25. It's just brand new 25. Correct. The same with the fundraisers and with the professional solicitors. So as an example of that, if you look on page six, um, at line 35, you'll see that current law already required them to register um but there was no fee associated with that so that new um starting at line 37 pay a fee of 25 dollars with each registration or renewal okay and um sorry it's just not as easy for me to have the bill right in front of me with just this one screen so when you say professional fundraiser that's a person that is not an event like i'm having a fundraiser for my nonprofit. that's a person 
And so it's is a, the professional solicitor, it's a person? Yes. I mean, I yes. know that is, but yeah. Okay. They both are. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other, uh -huh. Any other questions for Natalie? Okay. We will. Okay. Now any questions for Clay? Representative Carmichael, your hand's still just up in the virtual world, correct? Yes, I think so. Okay, so now we will move, move on to the Attorney General. Welcome to the committee, sir. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you and thank you to the committee for uh, hearing this bill. We were excited to have it heard last year when, as you've already heard, uh, we ran into the, the COVID interruption in mid to late March. Uh, Representative Carmichael is certainly correct that uh, this bill is familiar, not only for the reasons that uh, Natalie described, which are all correct, that it was um, part of a bundle that came over from the Senate 38 to 1 last year and was teed up in this committee for consideration before COVID ended the session early. But also for some of you who have been around for a while, this concept was heard by this committee, by your committee, uh, back in 2018. We originally proposed legislation to uh, consolidate the Charitable Organization Solicitation Act functions in a single agency, the Attorney General's Office. We actually proposed that the first time uh, under Secretary Schwab's predecessor, Secretary Kobach. Secretary of State's office was neutral on the bill at that point. We were supporting it. Your committee recommended the bill out, but it never got above the line and ran. And then, as Clay said, when Secretary Schwab came to office, so we sat down our, our, our two offices together and looked at a, several different programs that um, we thought might be administered more effectively by moving them or consolidating them uh, as to our two agencies. That's when we came up with a somewhat revised version of the bill that we introduced in the Senate as part of that bundle last year, passed their 38 to 1, came to you, was heard, and then uh, session ended. So my point in saying all that is it, it's not a new issue, and so if it sounds familiar, that's why. Uh, I'll try not to repeat much. You have my written testimony. The, the big picture here is this is a very small program. Uh, the total cost of running it in a given year is around $150,000, give or take. Uh, it is paid for by uh, its users, and its purpose is to help uh, make sure that we don't have uh, fraudulent uh, charities and fundraisers operating out there, preying on people's goodwill, and also to make sure that there's sufficient transparency and disclosure of, for example, financial information uh, about uh, charitable solicitations. So it's a, it's a long established program, but even though it's a very small program for reasons that Clay suggested that I think are, are historical and not really pertinent today. Uh, it, it's been administered by two different agencies for all these many years, and we just don't think that's a very efficient way to run a particularly small program. And we're pleased to, uh, you know, be able to work with the Secretary of State's office to come up with this proposal to consolidate everything together uh, in the Attorney General's office. We think it's a good fit in our operation. We'll be glad to do it if, if it comes here. Uh, we have several other registration programs now that we run, ranging from concealed carry to private detectives to uh, roofing contractors. So we're accustomed to doing that now in a way we might not have been 20 years ago when uh, this program, the charities program, was first bifurcated. And of course, at its core, this is a consumer protection program, and our consumer protection division is very comfortable working in charities enforcement and uh, actually rather looks forward to having the program all under one roof. The only other thing I might say uh, in response to uh, something that Natalie mentioned and Representative Humphreys raised, uh, Natalie's certainly correct in what she uh, said that there are uh, fees. There are three different entities regulated under current law. There's the charitable organization itself. There's what's called a professional fundraiser, which is basically typically a fundraising company. And then there's what the law calls a professional solicitor, which typically is the employee of a fundraising company. Those aren't precise definitions, but that's kind of the general concept. And it is true that under the, the statute, this statute, currently there's a $20 annual registration fee for charitable organizations and zero for the other two, the professional fundraiser and the charitable or the professional solicitor. But there is more to the story, and I'd be glad to get down really in the weeds if, if the committee cares, but suffice it to say, there are some what I will call umbrella or overarching fees imposed by law at the Secretary of State's office. Clay can talk about that. 
and all three of these entities now pay those fees in addition to um, a, a regulatorily established fee on fundraisers and solicitors. So here's the bottom line. If this bill gets uh, adopted the way it's proposed, professional fundraisers will pay the same amount they're currently paying, $25. Professional solicitors will pay the same amount they're currently paying, $25. They'll just pay it under a different legal authority than currently requires it. Charitable organizations actually will pay slightly less than what they're currently paying. Uh, because even though their fee under this act goes up from 20 to 25 dollars their other fees i think they call it an administrative fee and a technology fee at the secretary of state's office would no longer attach and those total together uh, 15 dollars so that would actually go down slightly from uh, 35 to 25 dollars so uh, with that clarification i'd be glad to stand for questions mr chairman very good first one up is representative carmichael Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two areas of inquiry for our Attorney General. First, I appreciate you reminding us uh, that we actually did see this bill back in 17, and I know it was before the committee, and it may have even gone on the House floor. It ran into some difficulty because at the time, there were some scurrilous allegations made by the Better Business Bureau against our then uh, Secretary of State regarding a veterans, charitable veterans organization, and that threw it off track. I, I don't know if that rings any bells with the rest of the committee, but that was my memory that, that we had some difficulty getting it across. Do you, do you recall, Mr. Attorney General, what happened to us back in 17? Why we, why we didn't get this accomplished a long time ago like we should have? Representative, I don't remember that. Um, I believe my notes say it was 18, not 17, just to- You're probably correct. Um, what I what I do know from, from our records and my memory is that we brought the bill across to you in 2018, I believe it was. You had the hearing and the Secretary of State's office at that time uh, testified as a neutral. And I believe your committee recommended the bill out. I don't I, have a memory of the veterans yeah. issue that you raised. That's that's okay. I'll go back and look because I recall offering committee testimony, and so I'll look in my files and see if I can refresh my memory. My second question concerns the eighty-four thousand dollar fiscal note of money that's not going to the SGF because of fees that were previously collected by the uh, Secretary of State. Can you explain to us how that works? I'm not complaining. I just kind of want to know why we lose 85,000 or why we've been collecting 85,000 that maybe we didn't need to, if you could just help us with that. Yeah, Representative, I'd be happy to, and then I, I would defer to Clay since it is his office and his agency in case I either omit something or, or say something that's a little off. But here is my understanding, and it is somewhat, uh, somewhat complicated. The current statute, this statute, the Charitable Organization and Solicitations Act, imposes a $20 annual registration fee on charitable organizations, but imposes no fee, as I mentioned before, on professional fundraisers or solicitors. Oddly enough, for reasons that I, I don't know why, somewhere back in the mists of history, even though this is a fee-funded program that has a specific statutory fee that is supposed to pay for it, that $20 fee on charitable organizations, that money actually has not been going to this program for some years. Instead, that $20 fee has been collected and deposited to the state general fund, which, as a footnote, probably raises some separate concerns unrelated to the four corners of this statute. Um, instead, this uh, program has been paid for by these overarching fees imposed under broader umbrella general authority given to the Secretary of State that Clay can talk about it if you if you want more. So there's been this sort of, of shifting where the fee under the statute went to the general fund, but then these other fees that are generic and not specific to the statute were imposed and used to pay for the statute. And basically what we're suggesting here is we ought to right size the fees in the program to pay for the program and not use these fees to pay for other operations of government. And Mr. Attorney General, I agree with you. I think there's some recent uh authority that says we're not supposed to take fee funds and transfer them into the general fund to support the general business of the state. So I appreciate the work that you're doing here. And it looks to me like you might be able to accomplish these tasks for a few thousand dollars less. So good luck to you. Thank you. Any other questions, committee? Not seeing any. Is there anyone else here as a proponent? 
What about neutral? Any opponents? Okay, we'll close this hearing, House Bill 2080, and move on to House Bill 2082. And where's Natalie? There's Natalie. You're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, House Bill 2082 authorizes the Crime Victims Compensation Board to waive application time restrictions for a victim of a sexually violent crime um, to receive compensation for mental health counseling. And um, it also adds uh, certain children to the definition of a victim. So KSA or Section 1 amends KSA 747301 to define victim. We're adding a new um, person who would qualify as a victim, which is um, a person witnessing a violent crime when the person was 16 years of age or younger at the time the crime was committed. And then Section 2 amends KSA 747305 to require the board to make available on its website a method for submitting an online application. Current law um, requires that application to be made within two years of reporting the incident to law enforcement. But this bill would make the time frame within two years of reporting the incident to law enforcement, seeking medical attention for the incident, or filing a petition for a protection order related to the incident, whichever is earlier. Um, current law there also provides that compensation can't be awarded unless the conduct was reported to law enforcement within 72 hours or the board finds good cause for the failure to report. And this bill would remove that 72 hour reporting requirement and add that um, the claimant seeking medical attention or filing a petition for a protection order would be reasons that compensation can be awarded. Um, this bill would also remove the ability of the board to deny, withdraw, or reduce compensation on a finding that the claimant had not fully cooperated with law enforcement. And I can take any questions. Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Scott, this bill is also very familiar. Do you happen to have at hand whether we've seen this or something similar to it and perhaps what fate it may have met in the prior session? I do. So last year, this bill was House Bill 2495. Um, on the House side, though, it went to the Corrections and Juvenile Justice Committee. Um, and so they reported that out. It passed on the floor 125 to 0. It then went to um, Senate Judiciary and died over there. I, I will, though, make one um, <laughs> Qualifying comment, th this bill isn't quite identical. Um, that bill had all the provisions related to the board, um, but it did not have that change in the definition of a victim. And so that provision- It involves a child under 16? Yes, correct. Thanks. Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Natalie, I just want to make sure I understand that the bill, uh, if we're taking away the 72 hours, um, and, and instead, if there was a met, if there was medical attention sought, or there was a petition filed for a protection order, that is considered good cause in and of itself for the compensation to be awarded. Yeah, so right now you either you have to make that report to law enforcement within 72 hours of the incident happening or the board mm -hmm. has to find good cause. But that 72 hour requirement will go away totally. And so it'll just be whether you reported it to law enforcement or we're adding here that you're seeking medical attention or filing the petition um, for a protection order. So and there won't be that time limitation. Okay, so I'm just thinking through. So it could be a, I mean, it, it could be could be longer than 72 hours, possibly. That you sought medical attention or, or something like that, yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Any other questions for Natalie? Representative Wheeler? I'm just, because we changed the definition of victim to include a child witness this under the age of 16 um, or 16 or under, I can't recall what it was, but I just can't see a nine-year-old making a report to law enforcement seeking medical attention or filing a petition for protection. 
you know, the person who was sexually assaulted, maybe a mother or whoever, but that person may not report. How does the do that? And that might be a question better addressed to the Attorney General's office. Very well. It's more of a policy question. Very well. Any other questions? Not seeing any, so we will begin proponent testimony. And the only one I have listed is Richard Samanego. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? We can, yes. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Judiciary Committee members uh, for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of HB 2082. Um, as you indicated, my name is Richard Samaniego and I serve as chair of the Crime Victims Compensation Board. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our great uh, Crime Victims Compensation Board staff through the AG's office who are the really the front line of assisting victims through the process to receive compensation for the out-of-pocket expenses as a result of violent crimes. Um, this legislation was introduced last session and passed uh, the House uh, 125 to 0, as Natalie mentioned, and um, the uh, stopped right there. <laughs> um, we are uh, supporting the passage of this legislation as it simply would provide the board with uh, more authority to waive the two year filing deadline uh, for victims of sexually violent crimes who are seeking compensation for mental health counseling. Uh, when the board finds good cause for the failure to file within that time period. Um, currently, the two year deadline does not begin to run until the crime is reported to law enforcement. Uh, unfortunately, uh, victims occasionally file an application past these statutory deadlines and the board is required to deny the compensation, even if there was good cause for failure to timely file. Um, I would add that uh, broadening that discretion is also in line with the longer statutes of limitations for these types of crimes. Um, KSA 747305B does already contain two exceptions to the uh, normal two year filing deadline for victims uh, who are called to testify at sexually violent predator commitment proceedings and for victims who are notified uh, the results of DNA uh, evidence. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, those are not the only situations for good cause that we're seeing uh, for failure to timely file an application. Um, if we have a broader good cause exception, we can award compensation in appropriate cases. We recently had to deny a claim uh, on behalf of a child sexual abuse victim because it wasn't filed within the two years of the reporting of that crime to law enforcement. It was in part due to delays in investigation and prosecution of the offense. So those types of, of, of cases are hard for us to, to have to de deny because of the statute um, under those circumstances. Um, this year, the board is also um, requesting an additional provision which would uh, make child witnesses of violent crimes eligible to receive compensation for mental health counseling. Uh, by including uh, witnesses 16 years of age or younger in the definition of victim. To answer uh, Representative Wheeler's question, um, most of the time with the child victims, there is a uh, another person that's filing the claim on their behalf, uh, whether it be a parent or uh, guardian or law enforcement. And, and so um, that would allow additional compensation for that age group who witnesses a violent crime and it's you know, obviously a traumatic event for a young child uh, and mental health services are very appropriate in those circumstances. Um, other than that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just respectfully request the committee's favorable recommendation of this legislation and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. We will start with Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Samiago, I first want to express my appreciation not only to you, but also the other members of the uh, commission or the board. I I've appeared on behalf of some folks prior to your tenure there, and I know it's not easy duty because you see some tragic circumstances hearing after hearing after hearing, and I appreciate the folks who devote time to, to doing this work. Um, and also, I appreciate you adding the provisions for children who wit witnesses to crime. That's important. Help me, though, again, understand how we are, are expanding 
what in essence is a statute of limitations or filing deadlines? Is it only for victims of sexual abuse? Is it only for children? Does it apply to everybody? I, I just, I, I'm having trouble getting my mind wrapped around this. Could you help me? Thank you, representative. I do appreciate the question and your comments about the, the service on the board. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, there's just a very narrow exception uh, for broadening the uh, time period for the statute of limitations when it comes to sexually violent crimes. It's usually uh, when it's reported to law enforcement, that's what tolls the two years. Um, and we can only go beyond, be, beyond that if it's for the sexual predator uh, type case or also DNA evidence that's been discovered and then the, the, that crime, that person has to uh, ultimately testify and. And it's, it's to help those with mental health uh, counseling uh, during those types of cases uh, that are often very uh, traumatic. Um, so it's just really a very narrow exception for those cases. Most cases get reported, um, abuse cases, um, you, can, you can see it. Um, law enforcement, teachers, mandatory reporters can see it and can report it. But with sexually violent uh, sex type crimes, you cannot. And it usually takes a long time and a lot of uh, help for a victim uh, to oftentimes uh, report that type of situation, especially for children. So this is intended to be very narrow for those cases uh, and, uh, and, and, and really to help with the mental health uh, uh, that it's associated with those types of uh, traumatic revelations. And, and a final general question, if I could, How, where does the money come from to provide this compensation so folks understand who's paying the bill? And if you can tell us roughly how much money we spend on the program, and I don't mean this at all critically, it's a good thing for people in need, but could you help us understand that? Well, the, the good news is that um, the a lot of the funds for this come from the convicted criminals <laughs> and also that comes from um, also criminals while they are working while they're incarcerated. So a lot of those uh, go into uh, into the fund. Uh, the Crime Victims Compensation Fund is a both a federal and a state fund. Uh, we receive uh, matching funds from the federal uh, from the feds based on how much we spend uh, on our um, uh, on our uh, crime victims here in in Kansas, and uh, the you know essentially the uh, we have board meetings monthly on approval and denial of claims, and they can range anywhere from fifty to hundred cases. Uh, and uh, the G attorney general's office does uh, announce monthly through press releases how much we're spending. Uh, with regard to crime victims compensation, and it gener it can range from 150,000 to 300,000, uh, but it really depends on on the, the claims that we have um, have we received and processed. And how much do you get paid for your service? I don't. <laughs> so. I didn't think you did, Mr. Samaniago. It's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> Representative Jennings. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Richard, there's a number of specific federal requirements in order to remain eligible for leveraging the federal dollars to match against those state dollars. Are, do, does this proposal um, align with those so that we're not inadvertently uh, triggering um, ineligibility for matching? Thank you, Representative. Yes, it, it does. It does, uh, to my knowledge, and uh, uh, our legal uh, staff, our council, <laughs> council has reviewed it to make sure it does comport. Uh, there are different uh, guidelines and requirements for the use of state funds and for the use of federal funds, um, but uh, we this does uh, this does meet the requirements to receive the matching fund. And and one other question, Mr. Chairman, with your permission. Yes, please proceed. Um, in terms of the um, uh, expanding, I guess, the, the definition of victim to include witness of a violent crime when they were younger than 16, 
A major portion of this is really about sexually violent crimes. I assume that the violent crime being referred to for 16 year olds is any nature of violent crime. Is that correct? Thank you, Representative, for that question. That is correct. Um, I would uh, add that the uh, this is for uh, mental health um, uh, associated claims, which is a capped amount. So it's if a child under the age of 16 witnesses a violent crime, such as a family member uh, being killed or 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 uh, uh, you know a sexual sex crime or anything like that they would be eligible for mental health counseling up to the maximum allotted uh, in the statutes. Thank you, appreciate the work of your, your board and the office at the AG's office. Any other questions? Okay, uh, anyone else here as a proponent? Anyone here as a neutral conferee? What about an opponent? Okay, hearing on House Bill 2082 is closed. Committee looking at the agenda for tomorrow, we have two bills up. The first one uh, is the bids board that we, or bids bill that we had last year that has to do with the makeup of the Board of Engine Defense Services Board. Um, again, a bill we had last year passed out fairly easily and um, that it, it didn't make it through the process in time. And then the second one has to do with speedy trial rights. Uh, that's certainly an issue we're going to have to figure out how to address this session. I'm not sure, not weighing in on the on any opinion on the on the bill tomorrow, but we certainly have work to do on that, and we'll have, tomorrow begins that work. So that's all I have for today. The, I will get you a list of bills, hopefully tomorrow, that we may consider working by Friday or on Friday or not on Friday. Sorry, Thursday. Um, but that's all I have, unless someone else has something. Don't see anything, so we are adjourned. Enjoy your evening. We'll talk to you all tomorrow. Thanks.